welcome to our service. Let's pray together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Reminding ourselves of the summary of the law, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we've received at His hands, to declare His most worthy praise, to hear His holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Praying together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we have ought to have done, and we've done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and sincerely believe his holy gospel. For this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and then at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. 
The reading is taken from Luke chapter 12. And Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If you then, you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow was thrown into the oven, how much more will God clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried, for all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. One of my favorite authors, Dallas Willard, describes Jesus as the smartest man who ever lived. He writes this, At the literally mundane level, Jesus knew how to transform the molecular structure of water to make it into wine. That knowledge also allowed him to take a few pieces of bread and some little fish and feed thousands of people. He knew how to transform the tissues of the human body from sickness to health and from death to life. He knew how to to suspend gravity, interrupt weather patterns, eliminate unfruitful trees without saw or axe. He only needed a word. Surely, he must be amused at what Nobel Prizes are awarded for today. Saying Jesus is Lord can mean little in practice for anyone who has to hesitate in saying Jesus is smart. He's not just nice, he is brilliant. He is the smartest man who has ever lived. He always has the best information on everything and certainly on the things that matter most in human life. Just love that, uh, those ideas from Dallas Willard. Jesus, the smartest man who ever lived, said this, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's have that verse as our recurring theme as we take a closer look at the gospel reading today. But let's pray first. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So we're looking at Luke chapter 12. Wherever your treasure is, there is your heart also. Well, where is my treasure? Or maybe a better way of putting it is, what is my treasure? It seems that what Jesus is saying is that the way that I look at my treasure, what I see as my treasure, is an indicator of the condition of my heart. 
In other words, what do I really value in life? What's on my mind the most? What does the bulk of my time, money, and effort focus on? Now, earlier in chapter 12, there's a discussion of what many people see as true treasure, inheritances, money, possessions, property. And apparently there's a squabble about a family will. And you've heard that say, saying, where there's a will, there's a family. In Jesus' day, apparently there's an incident around a family will causing a bit of tension. Jesus does not sort out the particular problem. However, he does give a warning earlier in chapter 12, verse 15. Beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. And so to further illustrate this, he tells a short story where the sad conclusion is someone can actually miss the point of their life. The parable of the man who makes it big, as it were, and then, of course, it ends very badly. You are a fool. Why? Because he had not been rich towards God. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so in the story, death catches up with the man. It is not a happy ending. The retirement party, as it were, is over and he's dead. And as God the judge looks over the sum total of his life, he calls him basically a fool. Jesus is saying that this is all a matter of perspective. What is really important in a person's life? And so, very, very obviously, he says, don't get caught up in greed and the pursuit of of more and more things. And this, of course, flies in the face of what a lot of our culture values. Obsessed over might be a bit more uh, accurate. At least it is the focus of much worry. And worry, of course, is um, uh, spoken about in our passage as well. And so Jesus says some pretty confronting things about worry. Don't take on the crippling worries of this life, he says, because it certainly is a distraction. And you know that our life is often distracted and taken over by worry and fear. Jesus is longing for his disciples, for you and me, to have a freer lifestyle because he knows how crippling worry and anxiety can be. And that, of course, is not a new problem. 2,000 years ago, many of Jesus' hearers only just had uh, enough to live on. And there was always a pros prospect that one day even that would be taken from them. Most people would not have even a, a second set of clothes. One disaster in life, the family breadwinner getting sick or injured, for example, could mean instant destitution for a family. But Jesus says to them, don't worry. Remember, he's not addressing people who might be worried about where they're going on their next holiday or what color their next Porsche might be. He is reassuring relatively poor people that they do not have to worry. But people often do. We're all very acquainted with the fact that worry and anxiety can literally kill us. Stress, worry can cause illness, tension within families, whole mess of problems. But of course, there is more to the passage here. What Jesus says here goes to the heart of the way we are. This was not just good advice or on, you know, how to live a happy life or a carefree life. This was a challenge to the very center 
of his world and ours. Where much of our world focuses on material security, Jesus is pointing to a much larger reality, God and his kingdom. The kingdom of God is, at its heart, about God's sovereignty. In other words, you and I can actually relax knowing that God is in control. And so Jesus points to the birds of the air and the flowers in the field as an example. And it's not meant to portray Jesus as some kind of flower child of the 1960s, promoting peace and love, but to get us to really think, to think about our Creator God, who loves to give you and me good gifts, loves to give us even the kingdom, loves to bring His care right to our front door, so to speak. He loves to care for you and me in very practical day-to-day ways. As one preacher said, how to have your cake and eat it as well. Verse 31, instead, he says, seek his kingdom and then all of these things will be added to you. Jesus is saying that a person who invests, who sets their heart on the kingdom of God, who trusts now in him, will be provided for. Now. Sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? But of course, we know as God provides for birds of the air and flowers in the field, birds do work a bit. We do not sit back, but in the midst of all the worries and the pressures of life, we are reminded that God cares. So don't be distracted from this fact. But, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Now, how do you know that we are seeking the kingdom? Well, our opening verse, where your treasure is, there is your heart. Where? is my treasure. Look at verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God has given us the kingdom. If you ever doubt that, we look to the cross. The cross is the ultimate gift of God's grace. Eternal life is a gift of grace given to you and to me. And so, can we not trust God as our loving Father to take care of us? Fear not, little flock. It is your God's good pleasure. It's not his duty, not his necessity, not his obligation even, but his pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's the kind of God he is. And look at the phrase, your father. Jesus does not say it's, you know, your your employer's good pleasure to give you your salary. He doesn't say it's your slave master's good pleasure to give you your lodging. He doesn't even say it's your king's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He chooses every single word very, very carefully to help us get rid of a fear that God is somehow ill-disposed towards us, that he's, you know, begrudging in his generosity or constrained in his kindness. So he calls God your father. Now, of course, not all of us had fathers who pattern their lives after God. And so the fa- father, the word father, might not have, you know, all of the full peace that Jesus meant it to be. So let me try to fill the word father with some of the meaning that Jesus intended it to carry for you today. Two things in verse 32. So don't be afraid, little flock, for he gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. To give, to give. 
God is not stingy. He's not a Scrooge. He's not miserly or, or tight-fisted. He is liberal and generous, bountiful. It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus knows that the flock of God often struggles with fear. He knows that one of those fears is that God is the kind of God who's, you know, basically angry and delights most of all to judge sinners and only those who, who do good. Therefore, the Lord at, is at pains here to free us from any kind of fear by telling us the truth about God. He's chosen every word for your comfort and joy and your peace. The Lord promises you and me his kingdom. He doesn't promise to give us money. He doesn't promise popularity or fame or admiration. He doesn't even promise security in this life. He promises us himself. He will never leave or abound in you. It is the message of the gospel that God is absolutely, utterly committed to you and to me. It is a gift of God's Holy Spirit that we would know this in our minds and in our hearts. It is his true desire that our hearts would be filled with the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. That gives us peace. That is the treasure. And so right now, let's pray for that reality to become greater and greater in our hearts and in our minds. So Father, I thank you for my friends here gathered. And I pray that even now, even now, Lord, you would show us your grace and your mercy and your love towards us. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Come in your power, Lord. Come right now and open up our hearts and our minds to the reality of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you that when we forget, we look to the cross. We look to a God who abandoned everything and gave everything to us, his Son, the Lord Jesus. And we pray in his precious name. Amen. Let's continue by praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And please join me in praying a prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, 
Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful week.